I shall start by, uh, by really two apologies. Um, always good to start a paper with an apology. Um, the first is I am actually um, losing my voice, so I'm hoping um, and will try my best to make it through my paper and not crack. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the second apology is this panel, the subject of this panel is indeed um, the shaping of Western foreign policy. Um, but very much I wanted to focus on um, Margaret Thatcher's own religious beliefs, given that we are in a Churchill College, the, uh, the housing where her, her own personal archive is housed. So this this paper is very much a reflection on some of the research that I've been doing on Margaret Thatcher's personal archives. Okay, the title of my paper, therefore, is The Gospel According to Margaret Thatcher. In 1979, Britain elected its most devout Prime Minister since William Gladstone, one who felt confident enough, to, enough in her faith to recite the prayer of Sir Francis of Assisi on the steps of Number 10. But Margaret Thatcher did not simply deploy Christianity for rhetorical ornamentation. Her Christian faith was a core part of her DNA and the source of her political convictions. Many people talk about Thatcher's Victorian values, but to her, these were much more specifically nonconformist values, those which she had learnt as a child from her Wesleyan lay preacher father, Alf Roberts is a little-known fact that Margaret Thatcher was a preacher before she was a politician. During her Oxford years, she literally followed in the footsteps of Methodist founder John Wesley in touring the local circuit as a lay preacher. And she appeared to transfer this missionary energy when she entered politics. As one contemporary said of her, it was like she had taken up religious vows. She was so dedicated. Margaret Thatcher was a product of Britain's dying nonconformist tradition. She took from Grantham a unique but secure understanding of the relationship between faith and politics, which centred on a belief in God-given liberty, free will and individual salvation. Thatcherism, therefore, must not be purely understood in secular terms, not least because the chief exponent of this doctrine never conceived it as such. Thatcher was always an instinctive rather than an intellectual politician, and at the root of her convictions were religious political values. For this reason, Thatcherism, in a rather trite uh, soundbite, always owed much more to Methodism than it did monetarism. In this paper, I shall firstly go back to her Wesleyan roots in Grantham, and then I shall show how she articulated these Christian principles when in power, and conclude by explaining why I think Margaret Thatcher is Britain's last Christian Prime Minister. Even by interwar standards, Margaret Roberts' Methodist upbringing would have been considered austere. Viewed through the lens of today's post-Christian Britain, it seems positively archaic. Like all good Methodists, the Roberts family would say grace before and after every meal. They were, of course, teetotalers and only kept a dusty old bottle of sherry in the house for guests. If thrift was a virtue, then debt was the ultimate vice. And of course, it is a certain irony that her government oversaw the largest extension of personal debt in history. Gambling was firmly denounced as ungodly, with lotteries and raffles banned from chapel. Her father took an ill view of speculation in the realm of finance, and indeed saw the activities of the City of London as nothing short of gambling. Above all, Robert's faith was, the Roberts' faith was centred on an absolute um, observation of the Sabbath. Board games, sewing, even newspapers were forbidden fruits not to be indulged. For us, it was rather a sin to enjoy yourself by entertainment, Mrs Thatcher later reflected. Life was to work and do things. As a child, Margaret would sit in the chapel pews, listening to her father hammer home messages on the Protestant work ethic, God-given liberty and individualism. A collection of Alf, Robin, Alf Roberts' sermon notes are now housed in Margaret Thatcher's personal archives here in Churchill and offer a fertile source into the mind and manner of her father, of whom so much is been attributed but so little is known. As would be expected, the notes contain the essential ingredients of the dissenting tradition, individual faith and salvation, as well as the Protestant work ethic. He says, a lazy man as one who has reportedly lost his soul already. Contained here are also his instructions and guidance on effective preaching. 
Your task demands sheer work. Your sorry, your task demands and deserves sheer hard work. He noted, if you desire your sermon to make a difference to human lives and lead them more thoroughly to surrender to the sovereignty of Christ. There is evidence, too, of an, of an explicit tying of religion and politics. In one sermon, her father describes religious uniformity as a denominational closed shop, comparing compulsory trade union membership to mandatory affiliation to a particular church. These were pointed words from Alf Roberts, a dissenter and a virulent anti-socialist. Individual liberty was also always the starting point of his uh, religion and his politics. In a coded reference to the key debate dominating interwar Britain, i.e. protectionism versus free trade, Roberts hinted where he stood at the matter. God refuses to put grace on a tariff, he said. The contention was that universal freedom of the market mirrored the universal availability of God's grace. This hints at a doctrinal legitimation of the invisible hand, which echoed that of 19th century free trade liberals and an argument which indeed his daughter would enunciate with equal passion 40 years later. In another extract, Alf, compares, Alf, Alf, Alf Roberts compares spiritual conformity to totalitarianism. Uniformity, he told the congregation, can be a soul-destroying agent as evil as totalitarianism and can end in the systematic dehumanisation of man. Mrs Thatcher would later apply a similar point in her ideological crusade against communism and socialism. Addressing the party faithful at the annual conference in 1989, she noted, remove man's freedom and you dwarf the individual, you devalue his conscience and you demoralise him. In another sermon from 1950, five years into Clement Attlee's post-war government, her father offered a subtle warning on socialism, which he feared strangulated the individual and restricted faith. Men's, nations, races cannot be saved by ordinances, power or legislation, he argued. We worry about all this and our faith becomes weak and faltering. It's perhaps unsurprising then that Alf Roberts was not a fan of Christian socialism, then the consensus within the churches. He viewed it as a diversion from its evangelical calling and indeed believed that it turned the church into a glorified discussion group. Margaret Thatcher would make an almost identical point when, as Prime Minister, she famously gave a speech in 1988 to the Church of Scotland, reminding them, Christianity is about spiritual redemption, not social reform. In her father's mind, though, the real danger was poverty, uh, was not poverty, excuse me, but affluence. No man's soul can be satisfied, he argued, with a materialistic philosophy. How to morally square capitalism with materialism was, of course, something his daughter would find rather a, challengeable, uh, a challenge throughout her, pri her premiership. There is little doubt that the origins of Thatcher's instinct and values can be found here in the sermon notes of her lay preacher father. For the source of Mrs Thatcher's conviction style, we need look no further than those childhood Sundays spent in Finken Street Methodist Chapel. As her political speechwriter, Alfred Sherman later said, Grantham was embodied in her, waiting to emerge. Amidst the economic and political confusion that was awash in Britain in the 1970s, Thatcher self-consciously began to tie neoliberal ideas on the free market with non-conformist doctrines she had learnt in her youth. Concerns about excessive bureaucratic spending suited her inclination towards thrift. Fears about the state encroaching on people's lives went hand in hand with her instruction on individual liberty. While the desire for moral and economic restraint fed into her innate puritanism. Unlike Tony Blair, whose advisers tried to shield his faith from the public, Mrs Thatcher proclaimed it openly and often from the pulpit. She projected her own politicised version of the gospel, while her aim was to discredit the supposed moral, basis, supposed moral superiority of socialism and forward the Christian case for the free market. This was a deliberate effort, and as the documents reveal, to reconnect the broken link, she believed, between Protestant and capitalist values in Britain. Do not attempt to identify virtue with collectivism, she preached from the pulpit of St. Lawrence of Jewelry Church in London in 1978. 
I wonder whether the state services would have done as much for the man who fell among the thieves as the Good Samaritan did for him. According to Thatcher, it was the, to individuals that the Ten Commandments were addressed. We are called on to re repent our own sins, not each other's. What mattered, in her view, was man's relationship to God. Christianity offers us no easy solutions, she said. It teaches us that there is some evil in everyone. Margaret Thatcher's understanding was that as Christianity was a call to men individually, so it should naturally follow that political choices should reside with the citizen rather than the state. Even more contentiously, she argued that as conservatives start with man rather than socialists who start with society, conservative philosophy was naturally more in harmony with the Christian faith. This biblical interpretation, of course, neatly complemented the conservatives' new emphasis on individual freedom. The changing of the party's logo from the unionist sign of the thistle, daffodil, cloverleaf and rose to the torch of liberty was the most prominent indication of the ideological switch under Margaret Thatcher. Liberty was exalted beyond party politics, elevated to a saintly realm. It was not state-given, but according to Thatcher, God-given. But this was, of course, a distinctly Thatcherite, note of political, a Thatcherite notion of political and economic freedom. Thatcher never entertained the idea that the state could be an instrument of liberty. Rather, it was always characterised, either in Britain or in the communist Eastern Bloc, as a purveyor of oppression. Thatcher's contention was that true liberty could only be exercised through individual choice rather than collective struggle. On this point, she was prepared to confront history, judging that liberty origin originated not from the pages of Descartes, but Deuteronomy. As she rather undiplomatically remarked during the biennial celebrations for the French Revolution in 1989, all utopian hope had all only resulted in a lot of headless bodies and a tyrant. Her history was often as subtle as her theology. The problem with Thatcher's theopolitical vision was that it all sounded a bit too Victorian and completely went against the theological underpinnings of the British state, which had guided it since the Second World War. Many Christians would spend a large part of the 1980s repudiating the gospel of Thatcherism, denigrating her as unchristian and unmasking the social realities of her so-called values. Thatcher was undoubtedly aware that she was politicising the gospel, but it would be wrong to simply disregard her statements as pure scriptural propaganda. As unpalatable as they were to modern churchmen, these ideas had legitimate roots in evangelical thought, and more personally for Margaret Thatcher, were largely in tune with what she had learnt as a child. In essence, she had not strayed too far from those Sundays spent in Finken Street Wesleyan Chapel. The largely secular British public were not completely sold on Margaret Thatcher's Christian capitalism, of course. Mrs Thatcher may have created a, nation, a nation of Thatcherites, but few truly believed that it was a morally righteous lifestyle, even if they were content to indulge in the opportunities it offered. Where critics go wrong with Thatcherism is that they assume that there was no moral, only economic thinking behind it. Where admirers go wrong is that they appreciate the moral, moral underpinnings, but do not admit that these moral values were fundamentally betrayed when in power. Ultimately, Thatcherism was a failed crusade. Margaret Thatcher oversaw a country that became not more Christian, but more secular, not more unified, but more diverse, not more devout, but consumed by a new religion, materialism. Margaret Thatcher gave birth to an altogether different Britain, a nation addicted to credit rather than thrift, indeed a society that showed very little willingness to live by those non-conformist values that Thatcher held so dear. Subsequent decades would prove Mrs Thatcher to be Britain's last Prime Minister. Her successors would not engage in the type of sermonising that she so enjoyed. This had nothing to do with the fact that they were... This had nothing to do with whether they were men of faith or not, but because it was now seen as politically insensitive to draw on Christianity for partisan means, for risk of causing offence to non-believers or non-Christians. Paradoxically, while politicians spoke less about their faith, they paid more attention to religion, particularly Islam. Today's politicians may moot appropriate soundings that Britain is still a Christian country, but they essentially cater for the reality, 
a secular plural society, one where all religions enjoy the same protection and privileges, even though the Church of England continues to maintain its place within the establishment. The idea that Christian doctrine could or even should be the central guiding ethos of either the left or the right is now actually in fact totally alien. If Cameron has sought to appeal to a pre-Thatcherite tradition of Tory paternalism, he has done so without reference to its Anglican roots. Indeed, the confusion surrounding his big society agenda may in part be down to its secular articulation which is odd given that it, he is heavily reliant on faith groups for its implementation. Even in foreign policy, humanitarian interventionism is articulated in ethical terms rather than within a distinctly Christian framework. Discussion about religion and politics now centres on the rights of the religious individual and is increasingly dominated by those fringe fundamentalists, be it the new atheists, evangelical Christians and hardline Islamicists. The religious faith of leaders is not to be underestimated. It can drive some to war, others to peace, some left and others right. There is something overriding, overridingly important about a leader, especially a democratic one, who ultimately feels that they are only answerable to a higher power. When posing the question, how Britain created Margaret Thatcher and how Margaret Thatcher recreated Britain, it is to her faith which we must look in order to find the answer. <laughs>